For four weeks. No, sir. Thank you. Uh, bad luck to leave a toast on finish line. The four weeks. Your sister needs a look into one of your duties, lad. Or didn't you read yourself about it? Emerging through the fog, two lonely men, Willem Dafoe's Thomas Wake and Robert Pattinson's Ephraim Winslow, look out over the vast sea to an island housing a small lighthouse they will call home for a seemingly endless four weeks. But the lighthouse, itself an object primed for psychoanalytic analysis, has much more in store for them, turning those 28 days encapsulated within two hours of film into a deep exploration of human isolation, Oedipal fixations, and the Promethean search for knowledge. Despite being an incredibly tall and surreal tale, Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse actually finds basis in reality. Most presently, this is stated through the film's credits, which explain the film and its dialogue is based on both diaries and fiction of the period. But more subtly, the film is in fact based on a true story. Help me to recollect. Thomas Wake is the old, worn master of the lighthouse who tends to the light. His authoritative personality sees him consistently keep Winslow in line. However, as the film plods on, we're left wondering how much of this authority is earned and how much of it is simply fabricated out of lies and deception. Ephraim Winslow is a perfect counterpart to Wake, young, disillusioned, and searching for money to secure a future in the quickly emerging capitalist system of the late 19th century. He's been hired as Wake's wiki, the tender of the light. However, despite this fact, Wake never actually lets him see the light. As the film progresses, we begin to understand that Winslow also may not be who he first said. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we're going to be deconstructing the freakiness that is The Lighthouse. Stepping off the barge and onto the tiny rocky island, the duo prepare for their long four weeks ahead. To four weeks. No, oh, sir, thank you. Uh, bad luck to leave a toast on finish line. They get to work, but things start getting weird pretty quickly. First, we see Wake drunk and entranced by the light at the top of the lighthouse, and then Winslow uncovers a small statuette of a mermaid, coaxing him out to sea where he finds a real mermaid, but then wakes up as if it were a dream. God, this movie is weird. Seagulls quickly begin harassing Winslow, but Wake warns him. Bad luck to kill a seabird. More tall tales. <laughs> Bad luck to kill a seabird. And boy, Wake is passionate about seabirds. Over dinner, the two discuss the previous lighthouse keeper, who supposedly went mad after saying that he'd find salvation in the light. Instead of warding him off, these conversations spur on Winslow's search, forcing him up to the lighthouse, where he comes across a tentacled beast dripping thick gloop. On finding the water is contaminated, Winslow discovers a dead gull in the water source. Another flies down to attack him, prompting the brutal murder of the bird. Soon, the day has come for them to leave the island. Wake waxes lyrical about how good Winslow had been, but Winslow pipes up frustrated at still not being able to tend to the light. And I'll never let no man touch a Don't concern yourself with lad. Mine! But it isn't their last day, nor their last dinner. Whether it be the worsening storm or their warping minds, the days continue and the boat doesn't come, festering animosity between the pair. With their psychological well-being clearly going down the drain, Wake begins to change his tune on a number of things. Having previously said that he broke his leg, he now suggests that he lost it to gangrene. This forces an argument about Wake's cooking of all things. How can I possibly like the horse shit you fix us for supper? You're fond of me lobster, ain't you? Let Neptune strike ye dead, Winslow! Oh! His coral tine trident screeches banshee-like in the tempest and plunges right through your gullet! All right, have it your way. I like your cooking. As their sanity wanes, the two come together over drinks and dance. They hug, fight, and talk until Winslow spills his beans. He reveals that his name is in fact Thomas Howard, and the moniker Ephraim Winslow actually comes from his old boss at a timber mill, whom he watched die in an accident, one in which he didn't lend a hand. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Tommy. Last night you made a confession twould make a saint swear. 
It's important to note that for most of the film, we're aligned with Robert Pattinson's Winslow. This provides a basis for our understanding that the dislocation of time and warping of reality coincides with his psychological breakdown throughout the film. But while Winslow's mental state clearly deteriorates, there's plenty to suggest that he was never sound of mind even before arriving on the island. Whether the death of his old boss was intentional or an accident, the guilt appears to weigh heavy on Winslow's mind. I think it's fair to say that Winslow took this job far away from society to escape the potential repercussions of his actions. Another explanation for the contortions of reality are Winslow's drinking habits, which become more pronounced and adventurous as the film goes on. I mean, yeah, Turpentine and Honey would do some weird things to the mind, let alone the chronic alcoholism he developed. Given this, the misunderstandings and confusions we experience within the films start to make sense as many, if not all of them, are from the perspective of Winslow. Things immediately get weirder with Wake asking, Watch his and Tom is seeing himself dead on the roof of the lighthouse. He quickly runs for the lifeboat, which gets smashed up by Wake. But back in the house, Wake changes the story. He explains that Thomas was the one who smashed up the lifeboat and chased him with the axe. Getting drunk on a concoction of turpentine and honey once again, Winslow confronts Wake and beats him senseless. You, you ain't the president, and you ain't my father. And I'm sick of you acting like you is. As he's been buried alive, Wake spews off a momentous monologue and emerges back inside the lighthouse with an axe he uses to slice Winslow's shoulder before it finds itself firmly lodged in his skull. Key in hand, Winslow finally begins his ascent towards the lighthouse. The light miraculously opens up to let him peer in and, as anticipated, he goes mad at the sight of it, falling back down the stairs of the lighthouse and leaving his corpse on the rocks outside to be picked at by gulls, Prometheus style. This turn to insanity is drawn right out of the inspirations for the film, The Small's Lighthouse Tragedy. In short, like our characters, the two wikis at The Small Lighthouse, who were both named Thomas, got stuck at their post in a storm. The older Thomas died and the younger one, already holding a sordid past and fearing that he'd be accused for murder, didn't throw the body overboard and decided to put it into a coffin. The only problem is that the storm and his alcoholism began playing tricks on his mind, blasting open the coffin and moving the corpse's arm in the wind, driving him mad with fear. Robert Eggers and fellow writer Max Eggers added in two key dimensions, the psychoanalytical and the mythological. To bring the psychoanalytical tendencies of the film into full focus, it's easiest to look at the script which describes the lighthouse as an erect penis, positing psychoanalysis's infamous phallus directly into the mind of the reader. Eggers even made this link more apparent by exclaiming that the work was heavily influenced by Carl Jung and how he hoped that it would be a movie where both he and Freud would be furiously eating popcorn together. One of the most interesting psychoanalytical portions of the film is in the Oedipal relationship between Winslow and Wake. Oedipus was a mythical Greek king of Thebes who was prophesied to kill his father, the king of Thebes, and marry his mother, the queen, bringing disaster to his city and family. A myth taken by Freud and moulded into his renowned Oedipus complex psychoanalytic theory. In the film, this is displayed through the father-son dynamic of the two characters, where the father continually asserts dominance over the son without clear indication towards logic. This creates a deep-rooted contradiction within Pattinson's Winslow, forcing him to both fear and admire Wake, which climaxes in the infamous killing of the father, central to the myth of Oedipus. It's also worth noting that Wake consistently refers to the lighthouse as his wife. This would place Wake in the lighthouse as a surrogate parent to Winslow, perhaps explaining why Winslow was destroyed by killing the father and uncovering the mother. That said, psychoanalysis has many different paths. For example, looking at the film from a Jungian perspective may suggest that Winslow and Wake could represent two aspects of the same person's psychology, such as the bestial id versus the desire-ridden ego, while from a Nietzschean perspective, it could be a critique of morality and autonomy. My point is, there are millions of ways to interpret this, and... Ain't nobody got time for that. While psychoanalysis can often seem like a stretch, the links to the myth of Prometheus are far more clear. Prometheus was a titan god of fire that defied the gods by stealing the coveted fire of Olympus and giving it to humanity, enabling us to stand upright like the gods and look up to the heavens. As a result, Prometheus was punished by Zeus, most commonly by being bound to a rock and having an eagle eat his liver for eternity. 
While the symbol of fire can be taken at face value here, it's often also interpreted as intelligence, knowledge, and culture. For more on this myth, check out my video on how the movie Prometheus failed at Alien. With all that being said, the parallels between the myth of Prometheus and the lighthouse run deep. Most obviously, the fire of the light is coveted by the all-powerful Wake and is wanted by the seemingly lesser Winslow. What's more is that the fire of the light takes a much more symbolic meaning throughout the lighthouse, with Winslow and the wiki before him both wanting to receive the knowledge of the light more than any physical light itself, the lack of which drives them both mad. Here we see Winslow take on the role of Prometheus, attempting to usurp the light, and Wake taking on the role of Zeus, acting both as a superior deity and a prophetic punisher. But beyond the many references and methods of reading the film through truth, psychoanalysis, and myth, the one sentiment that resonates with me most is that you shouldn't mix turpentine with honey. That's the trouble with you. That's the trouble with you. With you! With you! No! No!